this past week, I saw where a church uh, had a special blessing service for drag queens. Church. Now, now, this is my feelings. You live your life however you want to, and I'll do mine, okay? And, I, and I'm not going to run around your house and put posters saying that you're wrong with what you're doing, and I don't want you doing my house either. But for the church to accept such perversion, then how can the world look at us and say, where's the truth? Because we are no different than the world. Christian people are not living any different, or so-called Christian people are not living any different than the world. We're not dressing different. We're not speaking different. We're not doing things that are different. Listen, the Bible says, come out from among them and be ye separate. That means that we are to speak different. We are to dress different. We are to act different. I remember seeing this um, little thing where this highway patrol pulled this older lady off and was going to give her a ticket or was going to arrest her for stealing the car. And he said, ma'am, you need to show me your license and registration because I think this car is stolen. And she said, well, it ain't stolen, it's mine. He said, well, there's a honk if you love Jesus sticker on your bumper and you made a suggestion to that driver that come around you a while ago and I knew no Christian would do what you did and still have a sticker and talk about Jesus. So I'm assuming that car is stolen. But we live in that time and people are confused. Now, some of you are old people out there. You are. Not a problem. We don't have an issue knowing right and wrong. But our kids are being raised into thinking all of this stuff is normal. All of this stuff is okay. They're indoctrinating our kids in five-year-olds all the way up. They're indoctrinating them through media. They're indoctrinating them through society. And the churches are not doing enough to slow the decaying down so that our kids would know right and wrong. How are we to live with such a situation as this? I read somewhere that in the 70s there was this Jesus movement that began to take uh, over the nation and there seemed to be a lot more interest in church and uh, evangelism and discipleship. There were some more translations of the Bible created. You had personal Bible study, Christian broadcasting, Christian publication, tapes, and Christian music, and churches seemed to begin to explode and grow. And then we get to the 90s and it is just overly imploded when it comes to a God-fearing nation. Now, that's not to mean that the churches have declined because back then, a church of 1,500 people was a huge church. And now there's churches that have 8, 10, 25, 30,000 people going to it. And yet, those buildings that houses those people are not warning them of the truth of Scripture. They're not doing it. it. We need pastors who will tell you, well, you're wrong in what you're doing. Church discipline is nothing anymore. People need to say, you don't live like that and belong to the Lord's church. I may have told you the story before, but I'll tell you it again. I knew one pastor went to do a jail ministry and a young man walked up and talked about he was, a, uh, he was excited that he's there. He's heard of him. He wants to hear him preach and teach. He said, I'm a Christian and I'm a youth minister and, and I, I'm just so glad that you're here. And, and the pastor said, well, what are you doing here? He said, well, I had some tickets that I wouldn't pay. He, and the pastor said, well, do me a favor. He said, sure, anything. He said, don't tell anybody you're a Christian while you're in here. Because that would be the biggest, biggest hindrance to the gospel that there is, is those who claim one thing and yet live a totally different life. What we need are individuals who knows the right and wrong and who's willing to do what's right and wrong. Here's a quote. We're going to get to the message in just a minute. The pop church is everywhere. Christian television, radio, celebrities, entertainment, um, pride has replaced humility and success has replaced excellence and 
Cleverness has replaced character, and on and on it goes. Christian phone-in radios features guests that, um, with little or no commitment to truth or to Christianity and talk hosts who really don't know themselves uh, the right from the wrong and will no doubt entertain whoever there needs to be to bring about some type of rating in their show. When it comes to theological liberalism, that's not near as damaging as what's going on today. And what I'm talking about is sometimes there is a theological debate of Scripture and you know when that man speaks that he's talking wrong. You know it. Whenever they come to your door and say, hey, Jesus was an angel that was created by God along with Michael and Gabriel, we know that. We'll just stop and say, ain't having it. But all the junk that Satan is coming into the church with, he's coming in through the back door. It's not about theology. It has more to do with morals. And we are allowing it. I don't want to offend nobody. I'm not going to tell them they're wrong. I have as much sin in my life as everyone else. So we see the Christ-centered faith dwindling. We see powerful, convicting, preaching dwindling. One writer said, what could Satan do to destroy the church that would be more effective than undermining the basis of faith, which is the word of God, the object of faith, which is Christ, the goal of faith, which is holiness? Still talking about faith, about Christ, virtue, but really undermining all of that. We are living in an era that the new basis of faith is experience. Listen, that needs to settle down. The new basis of faith is experience. Would you like for me to explain that? Well, it's all about how you feel. It's all about what you experience. Well, I was laying in bed one night and I just had God speak to me and I experienced this. And I say, wait a minute, that's contrary to Scripture doesn't matter, it's true because I experienced it. <coughs> Emotionalism supersedes spirit-filled preaching. Those people who die and go to heaven and see all that stuff and come back and tell you about all their heavenly experience, you don't read about that anywhere in Scripture except one man, and God told him not to mention what he saw. I, it's, it's more objective or it's more subjective than it's objective. It's all about what I decide is right for me. What truth is is what I declare truth is. What's right for me may not be right for you and what's right for you may not be right for me. So my right <coughs> is my right. Can I just tell you, you have no right. And you have no rights either. Because the Bible teaches us what's right and wrong. So you ought to live the Christian life regardless of what you face in your life because of the precious salvation that God has given to us through the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's found in the first two chapters in this book. You ought to live the Christian life regardless of what's going on because of your present situation. And that means your effectiveness in the community. And you ought to live the Christian life with the idea of the second coming of Christ. Now, this is where we want to start. We have to face Christ one day in the day of judgment, yes? Yes, and you'll be judged for your thoughts and for your words and for your deeds. So how am I to live this Christian life in such a hostile world? And I want you to know the world, it is hostile against God. 
if Satan could, he would eliminate God altogether. He would kill God. He wanted God dethroned way back down the Old Testament when he says, I will rise up and I will sit upon that throne. I want to be the Lord over everything. He would. And if he can't do that, then he wants to destroy everybody by sending them to hell. And since he can't do all that, then he wants to destroy the Christian influence in the world. And by George, he may be doing a good job on that because our lives are nothing like God intends them to be. With the world so hostile against us, how are we to live? Let me give these things. First of all, in verse 7, it says, the, but the end of all things is at hand. Now, it was interesting when I started studying, I found the second coming in every chapter of First Peter. One chapter, you got to give me a little lead way on. Chapter 1 in verse 13, he says, You ought to gird up your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. What motivates those of us that are believers? We are motivated because Christ is going to come back and right everything that's wrong. And now listen because this may involve some of your friends and family. When he does come back, he will oppose everything that's wicked. What's, what, what's wicked? Do you consider your neighbor wicked or your family member wicked or your friends wicked? Anything that's not for God is against God. Anything that's not good toward God is wicked against God, Period. They may be good by giving to the Salvation Army or they may be good by giving to Jude's Hospital and those things are great. But those who are not willing to confess their sins and receive Christ in their heart and live a life of consecration before God are our enemies against God. And when he comes back, he will destroy all his enemies, period. Period. For us that are Christians, we should live in the hope of the second coming of Christ. And when it says there in verse 7 that the end, that little phrase, the end of all things, it means the consummation, the fulfillment. It means when everything comes to completion, it doesn't mean to eliminate or to do away with. It means the end. It's like if you was running a race and you ran to the end, you fulfilled that race. You completed that race. He's saying here in verse 7, the completion, the goal, the, the desire that we should be looking for is for Christ to return to set up his kingdom, to set up the new heaven and new earth. Yes? And when we live in that type of light, it will change our thinking. Now, I think I told y'all before, maybe not. Uh, when I was growing up, I always heard that Christ is going to come as a thief in the night. Oh, uh, that scared me. So whenever I sinned, I sinned in the daytime because at least I wouldn't be caught doing it. Until I realized it was not every, somewhere all the time. That was my way of thinking. But at least I had a little bit of fear of being caught doing something I shouldn't be doing. People who name the name of Christ has no fear of doing anything anymore. They live however they want, whatever they want, doing anything they want, and they don't fear any type of consequence. It's because they don't realize that the return of Christ is imminent. You know what that means? It could happen any minute. If you go to the epistles of Paul, you get the idea that Paul thought <clears throat> that the coming of Christ could have been during his lifetime. He said in 1 Thessalonians, he said, uh, Christ is going to return and the dead in Christ shall rise first and what? We that remain shall be caught up 
together to be with him forever. And you read several places, I don't have time to go through all of them, but several places, especially in his epistles, he mentions maybe the imminent return of Christ. And you say, well, preacher, it hadn't happened, so what are we to think? Listen, Christians ought to always live in the expectancy that Christ is coming the next moment. When we do, and we have a, a faithful, fearful uh, reverence for Christ, that will keep us from doing what we ought not to do. I know when we got computers and phones now that we have passwords on them because I don't want y'all to see what I'm looking at. The only problem is my wife knows my password, so that ain't helped out at all. Well, we need to have that type of thought when it comes to Christ. I better not do that because Christ can see me. He knows me. He knows what's going to happen. So you know what? I think I just behave myself. And when we do that, the world will notice. And the, the reason the world has little or no confidence in the church or in Christians today is because they don't see much difference between Christians and non-Christians. And the reason that we're not living our potential is because we just don't think Christ is going to come back. If he does, well, you know, at least I'm saved and everything's okay. Chapter 2, verse 12, mentions at the end of verse 12 that we ought to do all things to glorify God in the day of visitation. Chapter 3 is a little stretch, but hey, I had to have it in each chapter, okay? But in chapter 3, it mentions there in verse 15, he said, Be sanctified the Lord in your heart. Be ready always to give an answer to every man that seeketh you of the reason of of the hope. Let me use that little phrase. Of the hope. What is the hope of the Christian? The coming of the Lord. And the coming of the Lord is to fulfill all salvation. Listen, some of you think that you're saved, but you're not completely saved. But there's coming a completion. You say, well, are you, yeah, yeah. Our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. So what Hebrews says, all that means is there's more to salvation than what we have already gotten. And what do you mean there's more to it? Listen, there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. There's going to be a Messiah that we will be able to see first and foremost. There'll be a body that has no sin. And we will be together in unity and love and there won't be any wickedness or ungodliness, no tears, no weeping, no crying. Everything will be perfect. Yes, there's more to our salvation than what we already have. Amen. And when Peter said the end of all things, that's what he's looking at, the completion of everything that God has preordained in his sovereign grace. Chapter 4, verse 5, who shall give an account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead? Judgment. One judgment I will be at. The other two, I don't, I'm not going to be there. Well, I may be there, but I'm not going to be involved. There will be a judgment of the judgment seat of Christ. Chapter 5, verse 4, it says, And when the chief shepherd shall appear, you shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. You see, in every chapter, Peter mentions of the hope of Christ as he returns to gather those that are his and take them along with him. I've heard so much garbage. What was that I heard this morning? I was going to tell you what it was. I don't remember what I was I saying. My, I don't understand how people think the way they think. One guy was attacking the speaker because he said, you are against abortion, but you're not against raping cows. I mean, cows are, are made to, to reproduce and 
they may not want to do it. And, and he equated cow with a baby. And that was a young person. How do you do that? Listen, I don't know how y'all felt. You may be a vegan, and I ain't got no problem with that. But yesterday, I had a big old medium rare steak. I love cows. <laughs> cows were created by God to eat. There are certain animals that God ordained to sustain people's bodies. Yes? Yes. Anybody eating fried rabbit lately? Yes. Fried frog legs. Yeah. Somebody gave me a big old pack of liver, calf liver, but my wife won't cook it nor eat it. So if some of y'all would cook it, come to the house and we'll sit down and make us some cornbread fritters and we'll just have a ball. But where do people get those ideas from? Have you ever heard of um, gender assignment? After the baby's born, we'll decide what it's to be. I, I had a picture in my head. The baby comes out and it's blank. There's a male pool and a female pool. And so the doctor grabs it by his back leg and said, okay, mom, dad, what you want? Where do they get such ideas from? It is amazing to me what we're discussing today. It is crazy what they are talking about today. What we as God's people need to really grasp hope to is live in with great expectancy for Christ to come back and to right everything that's wrong. Okay, here we come to the crux of the message. You ready for this? What does that look like? It's not hard. And I'm going to show you something that you may have never thought about before. So just hang on. At the end of verse 7, it says, this, this gives us the means. And it deals with personal holiness. Be sober and watch under prayer. Now, that word sober just means to be sound-minded. <coughs> I, I, I've seen a calf born for it. I've seen a baby born for it. They don't look alike. Okay? Babies can't walk when they're born and cows and ain't long. You can. Cows seem to be a little bit bigger than a baby. You know? And so you need to have a biblical understanding of right and wrong. Be sober. Have a sound mind. Don't let the world drink you under the table with his philosophies, Amen. with all of his garbage. Listen, <laughs> if it's not spoken from Scripture, then I've got to a point, I don't think anything's true anymore. Because they lie, they lie, they lie. I want to have a biblical mind. I want to have a biblical understanding. And when God says it's wrong, <coughs> then it's just wrong. No questions asked. And when people ask me, I just tell them it's wrong. Um, one speaker there's one man that had a husband, and he asked the speaker, says, well, you think what I'm doing is wrong. I wish he would have said, what I think makes no matter. But now the Bible says, because if we use the idea, my opinion, this is what I believe, this is what I think, I don't care what you believe. I don't care what you think. Tell me what God thinks. Tell me what God says about it. God said in the beginning there was, was it? Male and female. And here's something that's just crazy. Y'all not going to know this. And you're not going to believe it. That's why he created all of his beings. Male and female. Cow, kangaroo, whales, whatever. And they were created for a particular purpose. And God told Adam and Eve, you are to be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. I don't need some psychologist or psychiatrist tells me, to tell me, well, now, you don't understand. You know what? I don't understand. Because God says, and I accept that. So what does it look like 
to live with the expectancy of the return of Christ, have a biblical understanding of right and wrong, and commune with God with that right and that wrong. Uh, I don't know if Stephen has ever said anything wrong in the pulpit. I've said too many things wrong in the pulpit. I'd like to think it was before I grew in my understanding, and now I know a little bit more. Maybe I've changed my mind about a few things because I think I've grown in knowledge, you know? Uh, And it's not because I willfully misrepresented God's Word. I ignorantly done it. But as I grow in my biblical understanding and as I have that communion with God, my understanding becomes a little more pure and a little more focused than it ever has. God is right. You're wrong. And when you begin to tell somebody something, make sure it's not your opinion, what you believe, what you think. Tell them, here's what Bible says. And if you don't know what the Bible says and you can't show them out of Scripture, you need to find them somebody that can or you excuse yourself, you go home, you study up, then you come back. Don't look like a fool trying to say something the Bible don't say and you can't back it up. Don't do that. That's the worst. You come up to me and you say, well, Gene, what does the Bible say about this? It says this. Where I find it? I don't know, somewhere in there. That's no credibility whatsoever. You need personal holiness. Let me show you a second thing. Verses 8 and 9. And above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Use hospitality one to another without grudgingly. Now, this is something that really struck home to me. In the day in which we live, how are we to live? The church needs to learn how to live together. This is not an exhortation between you and the world. This is an exhortation between you and your brothers and sisters. You are to love one another. You are to encourage one another. You are to be hospitable to one another. You are to uh, allow charity to cover a wrong that your brother or sister may have done to you. I've seen so many grudges among Christian people. That is unbelievable. Because it seems like there's a scripture. I ain't going to tell you where it's at because I don't know where it's at. But if you don't forgive others, I won't forgive you. I think it's somewhere in the scripture, isn't it, Stephen? I think it is. When, if we want the world to be different, if we want our politics to be different, if we want society to be different, if we want to have different laws, I am convinced this morning that when the churches gather together and worship together and serve together and love together, the world will take notice and say, listen, we must be doing it wrong. Look at those individuals. They must be doing it right. So when it comes to living in in expectancy, let let, let me help you with this. There's no reason to be a friend of the world. Let me tell you why. Those friends will not follow you to heaven. You ought to be friends with the people in the church because they're going to follow you. So all those you're trying to be buddies with out in the world, (coughs) they're not going to be around in eternity. But these people right here will be there. So you need to get along with them. And there's no stronger call on lost souls than to see Christians working together in unity. Now, let me see if I got enough time. Yeah, I'm going to have enough time regardless. I need everybody to turn your Bibles because I want to show you something. 1 Corinthians 14. Now, listen to me. Church is not for the lost people. Hold on. The Bible wasn't written for the lost people. So would you like me to show that to you? I will. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 23. 
First little phrase says, if therefore the whole church be come together. So who comes together to worship? The church. Not the lost people. Lost people can't worship. Lost people can't understand the Bible. Now, I'm not saying that you don't use the Bible to win lost people. I'm just saying initially it's all about the church. And if the whole church come, be come together in one place and all speak with tongues and there come in those that are unlearned or unbelievers, will they not say you're mad? If the world comes in, if they come in, and they see confusing, confusions, then they say, man, this is just a crazy bunch of people. And I have seen churches where they were split. The half the church said over here that could get along. The other half said over there to get along. Let me ask you, which part did you think God was pleased with? Right, left. Which one? Somebody, somebody vote. Somebody vote. Ain't none of them. Not those two groups anyway. Period. Now look, verse 24. <coughs> but if all prophesy, that means preach, proclaim, and there come in one that believeth not or one unlearned, he is convinced of all, and he is judged of all. And thus are the seekers of his heart are made manifest. <coughs> so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is in you of a truth. You know what churches need to do? Y'all need to come together in unity and love, uh, serving one another, encouraging one another, uh, building one another up, uh, and forget about the world. Were we not to witness to the world? Yeah. If you're out there and God gives you a chance, tell somebody about Christ. But your focus is to be with one another because what, we're going to be together for eternity. That may be good and it may be bad for some of y'all, but anyway, we're going to be there. Amen. The world's not going to make it. Amen. Go back to 1 Peter chapter 4. There needs to be that personal holiness with understanding Scripture and having communion with God. And there needs to be a common love. And isn't it interesting that it says there in verse 8, above all things, above every, in other words, if you want everything else to fall in line, love one another. If you want everything else to work out, I don't know about y'all, don't y'all want certain things for the church here? It has to start with loving one another. If you don't love one another, the rest of it's not going to take place. Most lost people will come in and willing to stay and listen to the message when they see Christian people love one another. Because you know what? When I see y'all loving one another, I got to get into that. This is crazy. This is not like the world. I need to get some of that. Hey, can somebody tell me how did I get that? Oh, really? Yeah, let me tell you how to do that. One other thing. Verse 10. As every man hath received the gifts, gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. And if a man minister, let him do it as with the ability which God giveth. Now, this is a whole month worth of preaching here. Spiritual gifts inside the church. So let me just wrap it up real quick. When you were saved, God gifted you. And he placed you in the body. And you ought to serve the body selflessly. It's amazing that you've got people say, uh, you know, we need somebody helping over here. Could, would you think about that? Well, I had to pray about that. No, you had to go home and figure out a way to get out of it. Let me, let me just tell you all this story right quick. Our time's going to run out, Brother Stephen, but it was, uh, you know, all we're going to do is eat lunch, take a nap. <laughs> Y'all know all I've done was teach all my life. <laughs> I've all, all I've done all my life is flew with kids. I don't like kids, but I had flew with them all my life. For 40 years, I've dealt with kids, you know? And so I went to this brand new church on the coast just a few years ago, and guess what they asked me to do? I told them they were nuts. 
I don't want, I, that's all I do. Give me some adults. Give me somebody that, you know, that I can talk to one on one here. And I remember I went home and I was convicted. And God said, Gene, I gifted you for this. This is what I created you to do. And so I called him up. I said, I'll do it. And I've been doing it ever since. Kids, little ones, a little bit older ones, teenagers. Can I tell you one of the most rewarding things to me is when a teenage girl hugs you. Now, hang on. You know what's even more rewarding than that? When a teenage boy will hug you. Because they know you love them. Now, that's crazy. That's crazy. I was gifted for that. Why would I tell God no if that's what he created me to do? So I reckon I'm going to die fooling with kids. There are worse things to do. You know that. Because I feel like I'm shaping their whole future with scripture. And here's something. Y'all listen to me about 30, 40 minutes. They listen to me. Five hours a week. Five hours a week I'm pounding in their heads. If I do chapel, that's another 30 minutes. All of you, every one of you individual are gifted. Now, I'm, I got to say this real quick. You may look in Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12 and begin to look for your gift. Well, let's see, that one, let me, that, that one, mm -mm, that ain't the way to look at it. My wife cooked cake yesterday. She gave me that cake last night. You know what the gift was? The cake. Inside that cake was flour and milk, water, vanilla, and eggs, and whatever else takes goes in there. All of you have all of the gifts that you read in Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12 in different measures. I mean, could you imagine put a, putting as many eggs as you do flour in a cake? <laughs> That'd be a little ridiculous, you know? So you may have a lot of encouragement, a little bit of teaching, uh, some of administration, but you all have all the gifts. You have all those things. So now here's the question. What is your gift? Real easy. You are your gift. With whatever God has placed in you, you're the gift. And inside of that gift is, is different measurements of those things. Some may be more toward teaching. Some may be more toward organization. But you should have uh, some of all of it. If not, you're a non-material Christian. All right. So serve the church selflessly, whatever it takes. Real quick, last of verse 11. Why should we do any of this? Somebody tell me. End of verse 11, I'm going to tell you, I tell my kid, I'll ask them a question, they'll say, oh, I said, no, look at the Bible. Somebody tell me, why do we do all this? Look at verse 11, tell me. What does it say? Yes. To glorify God through Jesus Christ. Yeah. Everything is to be done to glorify God. Everything. Everything. I'm hoping, almost 20 years at the Christian school, I'm hoping what I did was to please and praise the Lord. I, I, that's what I wanted to do. I don't do it for money. By George, I don't do it for money. And I don't do it because I get all excited by dealing with kids every day either. I do it because God has given me a responsibility and I have a privilege. Listen, how many people do y'all witness to? How many lost people y'all witness to every week? How many lost people do you walk up and start talking to them about Christ? One? Two a week? Man, I got a hundred. And I got 15 women that I think some of them ought to be saved. But anyway, um, I, I, have a, I have a captive audience. <laughs> they can't go nowhere. For 20 minutes, the grown women has to sit down and listen to me. For an hour at a time, those kids, boys and girls, teenage boys and girls, they have to listen to me. 
Isn't that awesome? <coughs> and you may not have that privilege. Yours may be a little more sporadic. The greatest way that you can evangelize the lost is to have an understanding of Scripture, loving one another, and um, serve one another in a selfless way. How do we live in a hostile world? Let the world be what it's going to be. It's going to be what it's going to be. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Amen. Amen. All right, let's all stand. Let me pray for you. Father, we're grateful for another day. Thank you for the privilege of being here this morning, the opportunity that I have had to share a little bit of scripture. I pray that you would use it in such a way that brings honor and glory to you. To those of us that are lacking, may you strengthen our hearts with it. And those that are here that are lost, may they understand that Christ is the only hope. And this morning, that they would be willing to confess their sins and to invite Christ into their life. Bless as we continue on, and may you receive the glory for it all, for Christ's sake. Amen. I'll be here if you would like to come talk to me, or Brother Stephen is standing there if you would like to talk to him. You come. At